And we are live. There are people waiting for this. And uh, when we get to a magic number, then we start the show. But I just want to say hello to everyone that's out there. Welcome, my friends, to my show tonight. You are in for a treat with Mr. John Fitch. Many of you sports fans know him. And uh, we're going to kind of cut through all the superficial stuff and get right to where he's at. And we're going to talk about reinvention. We're going to talk about where do you go after uh, how John, how, how many, how many decades have you been fighting? Is it like, it's over 20 years, right? Uh, I, I had a professional fighting career of 18 years. 18 years. I started when I graduated from Purdue university in 2002, but I started wrestling and I became a, you know, competitive athlete probably around nine years old when I was fourth grade. So you are no stranger to uh, to the sport. Nope, I, I'm no no uh, stranger to competition, hand to hand competition. Uh, you know, I spent a long, a big part of my y- younger life thinking I was going to play professional football and putting all out of my time and effort into trying to get big and uh, lift weights and yeah, play a lot of r- tough sports. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, everybody, I'd like to introduce you to John Fitch. He's a champion. That's the only thing that I can say. When I met you a year ago, I said, you're the champion. I remember <laughs> saying that. I go, you're the champion. You really, in my, in my eyes, you are the champion because I've watched you overcome so much. And I have a funny feeling that the mountains that you've climbed already are nothing compared to the mountain that's in front of you now with this reinvention. You're 42 years old. Am I correct? 42, 42 and a half. And as, and as we were talking before our, uh, before the interview started, if let's say, you know, you have a career in law enforcement, you just retired from being a cop for 20 years or an engineer or something, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of different places you can go, but you retired from being a fighter. You fought for a living. You competed for a living. Where in the world does a fighter go when they decide to hang up the gloves? Well, I think, man, this is an is a, a important lesson on, on frame, I think, because you cannot allow the things you're doing to define you. Right. I've, I've always, that's, that's why this crossroads doesn't really feel like a crossroads. A lot of other crossroads I had in my life didn't really feel like a crossroads. I think leaving high school, going to college kind of felt like one for a little bit. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with myself. Uh, And I was defined by my high school sports career kind of thing. So I think I kind of realized back then that like, I am me, like I just do these things. Like, you know, I had a, I had a path that I was already on and um, you know, the fact that I switched from pro football or not, I approached from, I, I flapped from football to making wrestling my, my path to, to push myself. I didn't even know like what the final destination was, but I was trying to ascend the mountain. I didn't know it was on top of the mountain, Yeah, but I, I made adjustments on the way. So, you know, I thought I was going to play pro football and college football when that didn't materialize. I just, you know, I was a good wrestler, so I just went on with wrestling. I worked hard, so I started wrestling, and then I found a way through fighting. <clears throat> so the end result wasn't even uh, it was something to do with wrestling. So then I, I went on to fighting, and now I'm here after 18 years of fighting, and I'm ready to continue on my path. I just have different vehicles taking me on the way. John, going from re- – like I wrestled in high school, and the closest thing that I got – Like there was no choking out or anything like that or tapping out Mm. back in those days. You know, you might get uh, you might get an arm, a fast forearm in the face or something like that. But there is a there's a big leap you got to take from wrestling to getting getting punched, punched punched in the face. Yeah. Like a lot of people can't make that. They can't make that step. I've seen I've seen great wrestlers come to train and they went to spar and one bop on the nose and. That was it. <laughs> I I just I can't fathom it. And 
All right. So how do you even? I, I don't even how do you know make how that I leap? Do it. I don't even know how I do it because I've I've had forty three professional fights. I'm not really. Every time I'm walking out there, I'm like, "What the hell are you doing?" Forty three fights, and these are not. These are fights where you get hit too. Yeah. I mean, well, I've had fights where I barely got hit. Okay. Excuse and me. you're getting hit with feet too, right? Kicks. Yeah, I've gotten punted in the face a few times. What happens physiologically when you get kicked or hit in the head or face? I mean, do you see, like in the cartoons, they see stars and the birds are chirping. What happens when, when, you, when you take one? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get, a, you get a white flash. Um, you'll see stars sometimes. You'll hear the ringing. Uh, yeah, you kind of get put into this different um, – you kind of get kicked out of your body. <laughs> and you're in, a, you're in a third person state looking down at everything. Kicked uh, out of your body. Wow. <laughs> All right. So when like a referee comes over and they make you make eye contact with them, what are they doing at that point? They're trying to look to see if there's anybody home. You know, you can look in somebody's eyes and see if they're not there. Is it is it something that um, like a referee can stop a fight right then and there? If, oh yeah, yeah. They can, they you're... can technical knockout. They can call it anytime. They they got to err on the on the safety of the fighter. So they'll do that. They'll do that a number of times. Because what happens a lot of times is you can get knocked out like a flash knockout with one punch, but then you fall and uh, you hit your head, or you fall and the guy punches you a second time, and the second punch wakes you up. How interesting! Mm -hmm. And in, in, in wow. boxing, like they they'll keep fighting, but. You know the refs in MMA, they they try to keep a closer eye on uh, on the action and make sure that people aren't aren't you know getting too many repetitive concussions on top of each other because that's where the real like CTE problems start. Okay, <clears throat> okay, all right. So you've had this really incredible career, forty three fights. Uh, what is your record? Thirty two, eight, uh, two, and one no contest. That is amazing. That is amazing. You know, when I talk to people who are employers, they say they like to hire people who've been in the military because some of that discipline carries over. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll be, they will be at work on time. They will, you know, be shaved or neat or like whatever, you know, like yeah. a lot of the military discipline. Optics will yeah. be good. Yeah. Is, is it the same thing with a fighter would an employer say, I got to have that guy working for me? I mean, like, it really depends on, on what you did with your fight career and how, how much notoriety I think you built up for yourself. It mm -hmm. could be bad notoriety. It could be good notoriety. But, you know, if you've built a good uh, following around yourself, then, um, yeah, you can, you can use that and leverage that into a career afterwards, into, into something bigger. What are some of the transferable skills that a champion well, fighter like yourself would carry over into another career? Well, I've been I've been an uh, educator since I was in junior high. So in junior high, when I was wrestling, we would have these little one week commuter camps, and younger kids would come and and we'd have to teach the little kids how to how to how to wrestle. So <clears throat> I started teaching other people a long time ago. I learned that it was easier to coach my teammates and help them get better than it was to just like beat them up or leave it to the coaches. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was coaching my, my younger people. I was coaching my peers. Uh, you know, when I, I walked on a Purdue university's wrestling team and by the time I left, I was, they voted me a team captain. So I, uh, I was always motivating and getting people to, to, to elevate their level to my level. Uh, I wasn't quite as good as Jordan was at it, but I, I watched that um, the last whatever the last uh, the last dance with Michael Jordan and the Bulls yeah. and their or whatever, and he had one of those type of personalities. Well, like <clears throat> I'm not saying I'm the same as Jordan, but that similar idea of like I want to try to get everybody around me. I'm gonna convince everybody around me to raise their several their selves up to the higher level. We're gonna be yeah. we're gonna be championship level. And I can, I can be hard because some people don't want to do it. <laughs> some people are just happy playing. So a big part of your career is the mental game, not just mm -hmm. the fist game. <laughs> yeah.
big part because I I was never that impressive just as an athlete. Mm-hmm. I wasn't always. I wasn't the fastest. I wasn't the most acrobatic. I couldn't always mm-hmm. pick things up right away and learn things right away. I had to work twice as hard to be half as good as, mm. as most everybody else. But luckily, I was stubborn. So, yeah, <laughs> that carried me through. Yeah, preparing for each fight. Now, obviously. There's things you have to do. It's not just business as usual. What do you do to prepare for a fight? And how long do you have to prepare? Generally, generally you're going to prepare anywhere from uh, eight, you know, six to 12 weeks, really. It just depends on what, what the fight is. Title fights or uh, sometimes the UFC main event fights will have uh, five rounds. Mm-hmm. All right. <clears throat> so I fought, I fought a lot of five round fights. And uh, just the training camp from three rounds to five rounds is a big difference because you're, you're training for a much larger, longer fight. Uh, it's almost like doing twice, twice, the, twice, twice the training because you're almost fighting twice as much. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you, you, you do your best job to peak on fight night. Okay. So it doesn't, doesn't do you any good to like kill yourself on day one. If you can't train for a few weeks afterwards, you know, you, you're trying to, Climb, climb that hill all the way where you peak right on top of the mountain. Um, <clears throat> and that's, you know, your weight, your cardio, your strength, you know, your timing with everything. So that's a real art into itself. A lot of guys have, have a difficult job doing that. I think having a, a, an amateur career like a wrestler does where a wrestler has to, you know, they have a season, but at least, you know, they're, they're training to peak at the end of the season for their tournaments. So there's a little bit of having that ability. I think that's a, an advantage a lot of uh, um, wrestlers have when they enter the sport. Because a lot of people are just coming off the street. And they haven't really trained that way, or they're they're you know training for jujitsu tournaments that they don't put the same type of peak uh, training into. But yeah, uh, and then having the mental uh, approach of realizing that that it's a 15 minute sprint or it's a 25 minute sprint. A lot of the people will train for a tournament, (laughs) you know, they're training for five, six, seven, eight matches, but really it's just, you need to get, uh, get that 15 minutes hard, get that 25 minutes hard. What do you do physically here? We have a question. Hi, uh, question for John, as far as leaning out, how many meals do you have a day and do you cut out carbs? I eat roughly six meals, eight, six meals a day. Two of them are shakes. Uh, I have a book called the wake up Bible that's available on Amazon that details all of my meal plan, my, my diet, uh, through training camp. And then what I do to cut the, the week of, but I, I minimize carbs. Uh, I, I let them, uh, I eat as many as I need. So when I start feeling like if I'm run down, I don't have the energy or I'm kind of fading. Uh, at the end of the week, I'll know I need to add a little bit more carbs. Uh, so I'll go on how I feel. But week of the fight, before I weigh in, during fight week, I, I don't have any carbs until after weigh-ins. Hmm. Wow. What about day of the fight? <laughs> um, yeah, so as long as I eat things that are not uh, going to give me an upset stomach, not too greasy, uh, not processed, try to stay away from processed stuff, but I'll eat breads as long as they're kind of paired with the uh, – the 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 protein right so i don't just want to eat all carbs i want to make sure i have a pretty pretty balanced uh Mm -hmm. diet or something like if you can get a really good piece of meat on a on a burger like that's usually pretty good balance Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (coughs) and then after a fight are you dying for like a banana split or a you know a roast beef sandwich what like a a ribeye uh well I'm, i'm not like dying for a lot of it because I still allow myself little cheat meals and, and things on the weekend. And mm-hmm. when you're eating, when you're eating like 90, 95% of your meals, like exactly on what you need to eat as far as nutrient uh, allowance, when you get to the cheat meals, like you get to indulge in the fun stuff. <clears throat> you usually get a higher quality of the fun stuff. You don't feel as guilty. You usually don't eat as much because your diet's clean. So you eat too much sugar. You start kind of feeling sick. Uh, you know, but if you're eating sugar every day, it feels normal. And then you start putting on the weight. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. 
but yeah, so I mean, like I, I have enough room in what I'm doing to still have, you know, good fun meals, good date meals on the weekend. Mm -hmm. What was your toughest fight and what was your favorite fight? One of the listeners asks. Toughest fight has got to be the GSP fight, of course. Uh, probably, probably, I would rank him pound for pound the best. I still think I could have beat him if I would have given him a second chance, but I'd say he's the best. Um, and the funnest fight was when I fought down in Brazil. It wasn't uh, necessarily just because of the fighter. Eric Silva was, you know, hot ticket at the time, and they're calling him the king of Rio, and I fought him in Rio. Uh, but it was the, you know, the fight itself was awesome. And like the whole trip, getting to travel down to, to Rio, you know, fight in the jungle, fight near the beach. <clears throat> Our hotel was by the beach. Like the food was amazing. Uh, I was going through like some financial issues at the time. So I really needed to, 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 to win the fight. And I, you know, I performed great and I got a bonus for the fight also. So it was just uh, it's a good, good experience. Wow. Now, I grew up. <laughs> in the 60s and 70s and i the fighters i grew up with were muhammad ali joe frazier like yeah. that that's the day that i come from and there was always that's, talks there was always talks about these managers that would rip off the fighters mm -hmm. is it the same thing in your world i know it's you're you're not in the it's, traditional it's boxing way worse. world it's way worse it's way worse really because because they, uh, those those boxing promoters and managers, they never controlled the title and the rank. Mm. Okay, so back in 1925, they came up with the uh, sanctioning body <clears throat> license, and that is uh, basically the body, the, the the organization who controls the belt, and the and the you know they they say who gets to fight for the belt. Um, it's a third party controls. The, the, the title that keeps there from being conflicts of interest between the, the promoter who signs fighters to exclusive contracts and, and them holding the belt because they're only going to let the, the guys who make them the most money fight for the belt rather than letting the guys who are the better fighters fight for the belt. If that wow. Makes sense. So, so there's so, politics in that. Yeah. So they basically, you know, in MMA, they created a, um, a pro, they, they follow the pro wrestling business model which is not supposed to be a legal business model. It's one of the reasons why we're suing them. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so in boxing, as, as dirty as boxing has been, they have uh, never been as dirty as Dana White and the UFC is because they've never had the power of controlling rank and title the way the UFC does. Like, everything that boxers did, UFC can do way worse. Or the, mm. or the boxing promoters and managers can do. They can do way worse. So, like, Don King has nothing on Dana. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Spilling the beans. Now, is this something that all fighters know but don't talk about much, you know, until they retire? Or is it pretty uh, well known? Well, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of guys don't really know <clears throat> the history at all. I, it, there's no education on it. The, the press isn't going to push it out there because the press is just doing PR for the promotions, which it's hard to blame them because they're not going to get the same access. They're not going to get the same money. They can't survive if they're not covering the things that the promoters want. But I mean that—that's what happens when somebody has a monopoly, like they have kind of total control over things. Wow, John from Bulldog Mindset gives you a little shout out there. What's up, man? Yeah. Uh, so here you are, forty-two years old. <clears throat> wow, you have so much to teach younger people about the industry, and it is an industry yep. as well as a sport. Mm -hmm. there's there's a business side of it isn't there it's a it's a business it's even more business because it, it doesn't really operate as a sport see that's that's where a lot of guys get tripped up because mm. the fact that the promoters control the title and there's no there's no uh cross promotion between promoters you end up getting fighters who never get to fight each other the ranks don't really mean anything the belts are kind of arbitrary so you don't get a true sport you get pro wrestling the fights mm. themselves are not fixed, so you don't know how the fights are going to go. But ascension is definitely controlled. Who gets mm. the most, uh, you know, screen time? Who gets pushed? That that stuff is all controlled. So it's not. It's a very. Uh, it's not very uh, um, American to the fighters. Quite mm -hmm. honestly, you know, yeah. you should you should be able to go 
to the promoter who treats you the best. You should have to sign big, long contracts. And, and it takes away from viewership a little bit from the, uh, the audience also. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what scars or pain or does your body bear after 18 years? This is not 18 years of grappling. <clears throat> this is 18 years of getting, you know, punching people and getting punched. Mm -hmm. How did, how does your body feel after 18 years of this? I, I've been wrestling for a long time. So my body's always felt jacked up. <laughs> so I've just gotten used to it kind of, I think my neck is the stiffest thing, but my neck feels really good. Since uh, like around 2017, I started working with a guy who, you know, changed my diet a little bit, uh, got rid of some of the grains and cut that back on some of the carbs, added more fat. I took, started taking a bunch of supplements. I started stretching and, and doing exercises for my neck and I started getting the numbness and tingling to go away. I stopped getting bulging discs. I, I, uh, I put all that stuff together that I did like in a neck care guide. I got on Gumroad for free so people can see what I did to fix my neck. Cause I had, I had three doctors who were trying to, uh, they wanted to operate. They said I needed surgery to, to relieve the pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, instead of doing that, I decided to <clears throat> go a natural route. It worked well. I was still able to fight three more times. And uh, I still keep up with the stuff because it keeps me from getting tingly fingers. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, um, there's, there's plenty of stuff that uh, hurts, I guess. But it's nothing that... Uh, um, I'm not used to, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure I've got a ligament torn in my thumb where I, it pops out of socket, you know, sometimes if it gets squeezed in the wrong place, um, you know, I think, I think my hand is broke from the last fight. I got to go the rest of, you know, tomorrow or Friday to get some pictures taken or at least go to the doctor to get the picture scheduled. Um, you know, I haven't had to have too much surgery, I had surgery on the shoulder and, um, Broken thumb, broken nose like four times. Well, only, only once fighting. Oh. <laughs> Three times wrestling. But, yeah, one time fighting. Interesting. And the ears, I had the ears before before I uh, started fighting. That's a wrestling. wrestling That's a injury. wrestling thing. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Someone says, what is your beard routine? Um, Man... I was keeping it short for a little while, but uh, I grew it back for the fight. Um, I have not developed much of a beard routine. I have a few uh, uh, oils that I put in it because sometimes it gets itchy if I don't put anything in it for a while. I discovered that some of those uh, those uh, balms, beard balms, take away the itch. But yeah. I, I haven't I haven't developed uh, much of a beard routine. I need to put more time and energy into it. I don't know how long I'm going to keep it because it's getting kind of hot and yeah, yeah. I, I it grows pretty quick to this point, so I uh, yeah I shave it fast sometimes and let it grow back. Yeah. Do you clean shave it or do you just like buzz it down with the clippers? Uh, I'll do a little bit of both. Like I think I'm playing around with trying to teach myself to uh, to trim it short on the sides, get like the zero you know, on there yeah. and, and grow the, grow the, grow the chin a little bit more. See if I can yeah. work that out. We'll see though. I, you know, you, you play around with it, you screw up, you just shave it off and start again. <laughs> it's a good thing. It grows back. So yeah, it grows back. Yeah. You uh, let's circle back for a second. You have a book on Amazon. I've got, I've got two books on Amazon actually. Uh, Tell us about them. So I have the wake up Bible. It's a real short book. Uh, my friend talked me into writing it because he's he's been along, uh, Coach Mo, he's been along to a number of my fights and seen me make weight. And he's got other fighters that just have a terrible time making the weight. So he told me that I got to tell people about it because I I do it and make it look so easy. So uh, I put it together and found a guy on um, Upwork to edit for me. And he put it together in a five-chapter championship chapters for uh for you guys to uh, go through and if you're not cutting weight you don't have to pay attention to the end part <laughs> you just you can you can do the uh the meal plan and uh and get lean but then i also have a book called failing upward death by ego mm. and it's the first in a series 
but I, uh, I've kept like 17 years of journals. Um, say that name again. What is that title? Failing upward or death by ego. So wow. Failing upward backslash death by ego. So I don't know which one it is yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going through my old journals and I'm sharing them uh, just with everybody. And I'm writing reflections on the stuff I had in the journals. So you get a lot of kind of look into a, a, a 20 something year old person with uh, the perspective and the, uh, the pressures that I think the things I'm supposed to be achieving or whatever at that age, um, the relationship stuff I'm going through the, the early stages of MMA and what that looked like. And, you know, it was kind of the, the wild west, not even getting contracts, traveling places to fight people. Um, you know, kind of a look of all those things together, the development of AKA, uh, partly I went through the ultimate fighter season one tryouts. So I, I have all of my reflections and all the stuff I was writing about as I was going through it in the moment. And, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I actually took a step back from it because as it was, it's too, it's too emotionally heavy to keep doing for the second mm -hmm. book. <laughs> I like, mm -hmm. I wrote two chapters and I, I took a break and I got busy doing other stuff. I took a fight. So hopefully we'll get back to that before the end of the year. <laughs> I'll get volume two out. Most people, when they think of failing, they think it's backwards. They think it's taking a step back. This title, failing upward, mm -hmm. failing forward. I mean, like, how, yeah. how do you do that? Most people equate mm -hmm. failing with, you know, going backwards you're talking well, about failing and going forward using it as a springboard a hundred percent it's it's kind of like uh it's man it's the idea of not being um uh objective uh um just stuck on the objective right you're not objective dependent you do the work you work towards the objective and then sometimes you do fail you don't you don't reach where you're trying to get to uh maybe you say you're your target a little bit too high or something happened along the way that you didn't account for. So you, you end up failing, but it doesn't mean like you, you didn't gain any ground. You're still, you're still up, you know, as long as you were climbing upward, you're still climbing upward. You, you, uh, you failed, but you're on a new plateau and now you've got to just figure out a new line of attack. Yeah. But at the same time, that's where the, or death by ego comes because you got to know when to make the appropriate pivots. And sometimes our ego gets in the way and we were unable to make the appropriate pivot at the appropriate time. And that can kill you. <laughs> the appropriate pivot. Um, that's going to stay in my head. How do you make because the appropriate we, pivot? So, so I'm 42. I just lost a fight. I, I could pivot by moving to another town and, and training under a new gym and, trying to reinvent myself as a new fighter under a new training camp and then come back again and fight maybe before the end of the year. And uh, that could be a pivot that some people could see and see as normal. But like, to me, that's, that's a pivot up a hard path <laughs> where mm -hmm. you're not going to get much further. Like one more fight, like two more fights. Like what kind of a run am I going to have at 42? You know, I'm going to upend uh, family and finance and everything to go to a new place at this point in my life, that's not, a, I don't think that's an appropriate pivot. Right. It, it is a pivot, but I don't think it's an appropriate one. Right. Shifting to a, uh, focusing on online businesses, um, um, uh, you know, uh, working uh, in, in uh, counseling people, uh, you know, giving them advice on what they could do to, to boost their brand and, and make more money in the sport, uh, coaching, seminars, those things. It's, it's more of a appropriate pivot pivot i think at 42 sure is 42 old for this industry are you one of the oldest guys uh you're getting you're getting up there um but like i mean just saying the old like just 18 years of fighting has been a long time even if i started you know my, my friend um josh thompson he does commentary now for bellator he fought in the UFC. He was a strike force tramp. You know, he fought uh, <clears throat> a lot of big names. And he fought for 22 years. He started when he was mm. like 17. <laughs> so, wow. 
like he has four he had four more he retired before me he's younger than me he's you know he retired before me but 20 he had 22 years of experience 22 years of fights like he was ready ready to be done so i think wear and tear has a lot more to do than age on you okay but that uh that length of time in the industry that is very exploitative and you realize your return on investment isn't what it used to be. So then it's, it's time to make the appropriate pivot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was uh, talking with a guy who is a, uh, a golf pro and he's really good at what he does. Mm -hmm. And uh, his last name is McNally. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I said, you do something, do you do anything different than other golf pros do? And he says, oh, yeah, I have people do this. I have them stretch this way. I coach them to do this. And I said, you have your own method. And I said, the, let's call it the McNally method. And he thought, oh, it's got a ring to it. Is there a John Fitch method mm -hmm. to life? If you were going to teach the John Fitch method of living, what are the first steps that you would teach somebody? Um, man, just if you want to be good at anything, you should try to be good at, at everything. <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you're putting your time and effort into something, you might as well do your best at anything that you're doing, even if it's work you don't really want to do. You know, I worked as a dishwasher for a number of years while I was first starting out my career, but like I, I washed the shit out of those dishes. Like I was there to be the best dishwasher, the the company or anybody had ever seen before, and that only uh, stuck to with people. Like people recognize the hard work and the hustle. You end up getting tipped out more. You get more uh, uh, shifts because they, the the other workers want want you to work. So the boss gives you the extra shifts because the, the the workers want to work with you and they're tipping you out more. So you're making more money. Uh, then th that boss has other businesses and he sees how hard you work. So he's willing to give you better position. You know, uh, you're making more money, you put that money towards other things that you're trying to accomplish and get done, whether it's your own education, whether you got online businesses going on, you're trying to start a dream job or dream business on the side. Um, you know, just gotta make it happen. That another thing just stuck with me. Like if you're a dishwasher and I'm going to be quoting you now for the rest of my life, wash the shit out of those dishes, wash the shit out of them. Like you're already there. Like I, I got a little bit that goes in my family a little bit. My uncle Rick used to uh, do commercial insulation. And they used to tell me stories because I did one summer of commercial insulation. And that made me realize I never wanted to do like physical labor <laughs> as, as a, as a job. But he would get all the best jobs. He would get sent out of town to do the best jobs because he worked so hard. And they would put him in the most miserable spots, super hot, and you got your flannels and gloves and crap on. And uh, he would skip through his 15-minute his lunch, and he would hit lunch. And instead of taking his hour lunch break, he would take a 15-minute break. <laughs> he'd, he'd eat standing up and – you know, people didn't like working with him because they made him look bad because he was just work. He just go and went to work to work, picked up his overtime at the end of the day. And uh, he did that for 30 years or something. And um, mm. he did pretty good for himself. Wow. That's, I mean, that's embodying washing the shit out of those dishes. That's, mm -hmm. that's what that's all about. Matt says, would like to know John's take on the UFC and its long-term effects on the brain. Are fighters more susceptible to things like CTE uh, a la football players? What is CTE? What is that? It, CTE is the term that they are giving to uh, the condition that they're finding in a lot of uh, dead ex-fighters, um, boxers, uh, football players, primarily football players and and boxers. I think the uh, sustained concussions, you know, you get two or three, you get your bell rung, you keep getting hit. I think that that adds a lot more to, uh, you know, the brain breaking down. MMA, the, the knockouts are much quicker. You get that first flash, you lose consciousness a little bit, the ref usually steps in to stop it. That doesn't mean that there's no risk. There's definitely risk there. 
I think there's less risk in MMA, but there's still risk there. And the, the biggest problem is the guys in football and the guys in, in professional boxing, they're compensated at a much higher percentage of the revenue they generate compared to the fighters or MMA mm -hmm. fighters do. Uh, UFC is um, made, made it so and projected so that they're never going to pay more than 19% of their gross revenues for, for, uh, for their uh, events. So like they know they're not paying, they're not going to trying to pay these guys for taking these risks. You know, NFL players are getting fifty percent. Boxers are getting anywhere from fifty-five to eighty percent of the gross revenues. So, <clears throat> you know, they're taking a bigger risk, but they're definitely getting paid out way better than we are for getting the same brain damage. Interesting. I noticed you used a lot of different phrases of like getting your bell rung, seeing a flash of light, getting knocked outside yourself. You have like a lot of terms for mm. these. There's these different ones. Yeah. There's, there's different knock. There's different types of knockouts. There's times there's kind of where everything just goes black. There's times when um, you feel completely fine, but your body's shut off. Your eyes are open. You see everything and you just fall. You're like, Oh, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, those are the scary ones. <laughs> the, the one where you said uh, one hit knocks you out and then the other one wakes you up. Yep. That's one of the, that's one thing you have to be aware of when you're, when you're trying to finish somebody and you're not going to, you're, you're ground upon somebody is sometimes you can hit somebody, they go out and then you hit them again, they wake up. So you have to kind of be aware of what your punches are doing. <laughs> that's a whole different world that like just everyday people have no clue. No idea. <laughs> what that's We're like. grown men and women fighting each other. Like we we are fighting other people every day for years of our life. Yes. <laughs> you yes. know, we may have, you know, a little extra, we got our headgear or shin pads or your, your gloves, 16 ounce gloves on, but like how much fabric is really protected. So it's a fight. Like <laughs> they're fighting these people. Right. Oh gosh. That is, that's a trip. Let's make another pivot now. All right. You are a proud father. You yep. have sons, two boys and a new puppy. He's acting up. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Without getting too personal. Tell me about fatherhood. It's pretty great. Uh, I really enjoy it. I, you know, went through a divorce over the last couple of years, whatever. And that was a gift in disguise kind of, because there was so much more stress involved in being around the kids. Um, when I was with their mother, yeah, because, you know, I didn't feel like I could trust her alone with the kids and them not, you know, them, them be supervised or them be taken care of. So I felt like I was on 24 hours a day mm -hmm. being Mr. Mom, uh, being, being, uh, you know, there for the kids all the time, playing with them, trying to be engaged with them. And then I had to also train and work out and earn the money at the same time. So I was like carrying, carrying double loads. So like one good thing that did come from that divorce is now that, you know, we have 50, 50 time with them. I get 50% of my time where she has to look after them and yeah. I get time. I get time to kind of breathe and do other things, which gives me more time and ability to focus on them when I'm with them. And that's, that's way better. How did you make the transition from John Fitch fighter to Don John Fitch dad? Uh, kicking and screaming. No, uh, I always wanted to be a father. I always wanted to be a dad. Like I was super excited uh, for it. Um, and it's been great. Everything's been great. There was just, just a little bump at the beginning. <laughs> now, now the, you bumped past the bump and now it's like yeah. the, the really good stuff. They're at the good age, six and eight now or, they're, they're super fun to play with. They'll clean up after themselves. Like yeah. I can send them out to walk the dog by themselves. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a good time. You can ride their bikes. It's pretty cool. Now, they know you as dad. We know you as champ. And do kids care that you are a champion? Or do they, do they brag about their dad, the champ? Or do they just... <clears throat> I'm sure they, I'm sure they brag mommy here and there, but yeah. I haven't, I haven't exposed them to the, the glitz part of it. Like they're used to just seeing the workouts in the garage and the boring stuff. 
So uh, I think they notice when people recognize me and they've noticed that, but you know, they haven't seen a lot of the, a lot of the big stuff. I, I did get to take them to a strike force that was here, not strike force, but a, a Bellator that was here uh, where I wasn't fighting and, and they got to see that and they got a, you know, I got the special treatment. So they get to see that stuff and that's pretty cool. So um, yeah, it's fun. We, I, I've taken them to soccer games uh, that Bellator was promoting and we went to, um, the hockey game here. And I, I used to train with some of the, <coughs> I used to train at the sharks shark tank where the, uh, uh, with their strength and conditioning coach, Mike Potenza. So, uh, we got, they, we had to go down and, you know, see some of the guys, but son got a stick. So they get to see, I uh, have some uh, cool experiences. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. At, at that age, six and eight kids start emulating what they might want to do with their career. Uh, they start gravitating towards things. Do, you, do your boys talk about, I want to be a cop, I want to be a wrestler, I want to be a football player, a doctor, like whatever. Do they talk like that? YouTubers. <laughs> that's the thing today. Yeah, that's the kids. Yeah. I want to be a YouTuber. Yeah, that's, uh, we'll see. We'll see. How that... <clears throat> we'll see. I'll, have, I'll keep having them, you know, they're, they're going to be, I'm all about, I call it, like, we need a rebirth of the masculine renaissance. That's, that's what is coming. That's what needs to happen. Yes. Yes. For too long, people have been forced to thinking, like, you know, you have this small window of things you're allowed to do and you can do. And if you do these yeah. things, you can't do those things over here. And I, I've never understood that. I've always just wanted to do what I want to do. So, like, I'm, I'm going to, you know, fight people, punch people in the face, and then I'm going to make some art. I'm going to paint something. I'm going to make something out of rocks or stones. Other than maybe I'll build something out of wood. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll learn a song on my ukulele and I'll sing it. You know, I, I, there's no limitation to like what a masculine person is. Like masculine person does what the F they want to do and they put their full yeah. self into it. And you're not afraid to bear your soul as you do it. It's interesting how we pivoted from uh, fighting and physical conditioning and getting punched in the face to you saying that you've always wanted to be a father. And that's that whole mm -hmm. uh, balance thing. That is, you're right. There's a masculine Renaissance where men uh, can be fathers. You know, they, they, they can, fathers. they need to be fathers and we, be, and we need to, needs to be drive an aspiration, like to be good enough at being a man that you can bring more people into the world and teach them how to be good at being a man. Yes. That should be an aspiration to all dudes. You might not be there yeah. yet, but you be working towards it. A gal that I worked with who watches my channel, she encourages me and all my guests. And I know she'll be saying the same thing uh, probably in, in the comments tomorrow. She'll say, we need to father the world. The world needs a father. And uh, can a man be a father without being a biological father? What do you think? Uh, I mean, you can you can definitely impact a child's life in that in that sense. You can be. Um, I'm hoping to have a lot more of my own. But uh, you know, I've had friends who slide into uh, relationships where they have children with. A woman who had children from a previous relationship, and they they would they would consider themselves as much fathers to those kids <clears throat> as somebody yeah. else. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's possible. So you want to have more kids? I want to have kids till I'm eighty. I love it. I'm right like there I, with you. I don't. I. I mean, <clears throat> for uh, that was that was the way for for millions of years. That was the highest aspiration probably for, for the male in the groups to achieve was to, to, to be the top on the top rung and, uh, re and uh, reproduce throughout their life so that, you know, I can, I can positively affect the rest of the world with all of my offspring. <laughs> this is like really weird, but I, I watched you. I, since we started talking fatherhood, I just watched, your your face just brightened right it's almost like a light went on and your eyes got brighter 
talking about fatherhood excites you. It's, it's fun. Like, like we have a little trip this weekend. We're going to, you know, they got their October break, not October break, their fall break coming up. Um, so we're going to take a little road trip, sleep by the sleep by the streams, sleep by the lake. And uh, I don't know, we might bring our bow and arrows, see if we can shoot something, have some fun. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, what breed of dog did you get? I got a Pressa Canario. She's a Canary Mastiff. Um, they're big dogs. He's, he's a monster. He's a little puppy. He's like 16 weeks old, and he's already huge. Does he got those huge paws huge already? Paws. I, I put a yeah, I put a story up of his paw in my hand. Like it is it, it, it covers the whole palm. It's ridiculous. Wow. wow. He's a beast. He's over here licking my leg right now. He knows it's about <laughs> supper time. He eats twice a day and he's getting close. Do the kids uh share in the care of the dog? They do. They do. They like him. Uh he's still such a baby though. We still gotta train him. So yeah. we gotta make sure he's not jumping up because he's he's so he's yeah, he's a puppy, but he's massive. So yeah. like when he he's jumping around and falling over, he like knocks people down. And doesn't even know it. That's great. Doesn't know what he's doing, yeah. Do you see yourself being married again or in a long term relationship? I know uh every there's no one I know that talks about divorce and has a huge smile as they're talking about <laughs> it. I know it's just one of those things where it just beats the hell out of us, no matter who we are. Mm -hmm. And here, and here's yeah. John Fitch, a champion. Mm -hmm. And, and you're agreeing with me on that. It's hard, isn't it? Divorce is hard. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah. Cause not every situation is like they think it is. And if you feel like you're in a situation I was in where I was doing all of the work, I took care of all the kids. I did everything, you know, giving up half your wealth is like real kick in the ass. It yeah. really is, you know, yeah. <clears throat> um, just because you're a man. Just because. Like, it has nothing to do with effort put in or what was done. I was successful and I worked hard. And because of that, like, I am I owe somebody. I, I just, uh, yeah, that's really still to this day. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling mind to me that that uh, is something that happens. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'll ever get married uh, on paper. <laughs> Like the yeah. government, the U.S. government will never know about a, a, a you know, a relationship ever again. Right. And uh, if I ever, you know, cohabitate with somebody, it'll be, you know, we'll have a some type of cohabitational agreement that's really outlined as much as I can. Because yes. you get at this point, I have two children. So if something were to happen, we became uh, even common law, a marriage. If something happens then, then, you know, that my wealth is then split again. And that's my again. kids. Yeah. That's yeah. my kids money. So now I'm, I'm putting not just myself at risk, but I'm putting my children's future inheritance or possible inheritance at risk. So yeah, I'm, it's not worth the risk to me. Yeah. It's very, very practical way of thinking. It mm -hmm. is. Do you think it's hard to find a woman like that? Um, probably, but I think, yeah, I think, I don't know. I don't know because what type of woman are we trying to <laughs> think is easy to find these days? Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. like what, you know, it's, it's hard to have any type of standards today and meet, <laughs> meet somebody. Yeah. Uh, I try to keep good standards, but you know, cause you have, you think about your kids yet you think about who you might possibly letting around your kids or who might get forced into your life because of an accidental pregnancy or something like that. It's just, yeah. There's a lot of risks out there. Yeah. What advice would you give to uh, a younger man, let's say a 25-year-old guy who's watching this, uh, when it comes to women? What would you say to him? Uh, you're, you still have no worth yet. You have no value. So don't, don't isolate yourself to one woman right now. Build yourself. You can, you, know, you can date. You can have relationships. But like, don't be thinking about marriage until you're 32 to 35, maybe 37 <laughs> You know, and then start looking around for a serious wife. Yeah. Right. That's that's your age now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. Mm. It's I think that's easier for um, maybe a younger person to think. I yeah. know uh, at, at my age, everyone my age wants to run to the altar. And I mm. and I and I 
I know better than that. But I see just one guy after another just running off the cliff, you know? And, yeah. um, yeah. No, I mean, that's, yeah, it is. A lot of people are, yeah, I don't know, I understand that. Like, I almost said, you get to a certain point and the people don't take marriage seriously at all <laughs> anymore. Uh, you know, like, uh, I know of people who, yeah, have married their seventh spouse. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I don't, uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can, you can, uh, I, I don't know what it is. I, I, it's a cult. It really is a cult. Mm -hmm. Marriage and relationships, it's a cult because um, you're not allowed to talk about like real issues in the cult. You can't, you can't say anything against the cult. You just have to keep ascribing by the logic of that cult. And marriage is great and you should be looking for this person to yeah. settle down. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. How long should people date before they move in or call themselves a couple? What do you think? That's a, that's, I mean, man, that's a hard, it's a hard one because I dated my ex for seven and a half years before we got married. Wow. I, w I would have thought I had them vetted plenty, but things can change quickly. Uh, I mean, nobody, <laughs> nobody can accuse you of being impulsive over exactly. seven years. Wow. Yeah. So like, and uh, man, I would, I would say you need to protect yourself. <laughs> As a guy, you need to protect yourself financially. If you're moving in with the girl, uh, make sure you have some kind of partnership agreement, domestic partnership agreement filled out, signed. Um, you should make sure that you are in charge of your finances and she doesn't ever know about your finances or how much money you make. I think that's another safe, safe bet you can make. But you have to prepare yourself to defend yourself against the state against the government. It's not so much yeah. the girl it has nothing to do with her. She'd be the greatest girl ever. But yeah. this, if, if the opportunity presents itself and the state makes it possible, you know, it's not worth the risk. The angel that we marry is never the devil that we divorce. Mm. Do you think even, maybe even you when they're being completely nice and, uh, you know, sane, right, rational type of per person, they still are going to take at least half and your kids. Sure. sure. <laughs> like best case scenario, you lose half. Best case and, scenario. Yeah. And, and have access to your kids. And then, yeah. Yeah. That's quite interesting. Do you think after knowing each other for that long, and I've heard people say this, I heard, I've heard people say this quote, we ruined it by getting married. What if you didn't get married? Do you think marriage? Well, I think that was one of, of the problems is you, you get part of that, uh, that cult, right? Is you get the one-itis and then you, 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 uh, you obsess about this one person and you put the blinders on and, and you end up not seeing all the red flags that show you that you probably shouldn't, you should probably have let this one go. This is probably run its yeah. course, you know, long term is not going to be there and yeah. i think uh that's one of the problems in in the, those in my books is because this relationship was throughout those books and uh, you know I, I i started seeing signs that i didn't see at the time mm -hmm. <clears throat> back back in the in the journals so like some of some of that stuff will come out a little bit more in the future books but th there's a good chance that we probably shouldn't have gotten married but then again if we wouldn't have gotten married we wouldn't have had our kids right Right. I like to think, uh, cause I've, I've been divorced about 17 years. I like to think that, and I have three children. I like to think that my, uh, my marriage was a mistake, but my kids weren't. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I kind of, that's 100%. how I rationalize it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So do you think that the failing upward philosophy mindset, do you think you can apply that to, your marriage and divorce experience. Has it made you a better person? Can you transfer that failing upward mindset and send the divorce through that filter? Or do you bear the bruises and the scars of marriage still? Because I know I still I still have pain from my divorce. I mean it's it's not 
obvious. It's I don't wear it on my sleeve, but when I really think about it, I go, man, that really sucked. I um, I still get angry because I, I think about what I could do with the money if I'd had it. You know, I could have invested in this. I could have done this. I could have, you know, that that always gets to me. It always bothers me because I did the work <laughs> already. Yeah. You know, um, and then uh, and you weren't uh, a kid when you got married either. No, I was in. I was thirty-two or something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so you know that always that always is an irritant. Just but but I'm at the same time I get irritated with the fact that when I look back to the UFC and how much money they were they were kind of you know taking off the top when they're paying all of us fighters. That yeah. they, that still irritates me too. But um, you know I'm thankful for the lessons that I've learned because. I understand why the things in my relationship kind of handled ha played out the way they did, you know, understanding uh, human behavior a lot more and what our, what our, uh, our programming kind of is around certain things. You know, we're not, we're not slaves to our primitive mind, but if we don't pay attention to it, we are slaves to it. You know, right. we have to be, we have to be aware of why we start having certain urges or why certain things are going on, you know, <clears throat> uh, yeah, understanding relationships better, kind of understanding women a lot better. That that kind of is a definite level up in my life. Um, I can say after kind of like the last two years of kind of going down that little red pull rabbit hole in relationships and stuff, like I, I don't think I've ever been happier. Even though the my future is even more uncertain than it ever has been before, because. Man, for a number of years while I was married, like everything was like trying to make her happy and then living in complete fear and misery because everything revolved around, oh, can I make her happy this day or right. or what can I do to make the happy wife, happy life happen today? And instead of like, okay, these are my missions, getting up in the morning excited to go do my stuff. And uh, the people who choose to be around, they choose to be around rather than you know, forcing me to, to get off of what I'm doing to make them happy. Mm -hmm. That's uh that you can't replace that feeling. I've always said, if I get married again, which I hope to, I'll be the world's first married MGTOW mm -hmm. in the sense that when you marry the second time, you marry for completely different reasons than you do the first time. And you preserve, uh, well, this is what I, you know, initially when, many men go through breakups they try really hard and i when i coach men they they're always trying hard to get their wife back and i say no your your task right now is to get you back mm -hmm. you lost you in that marriage you need to yep. get you back you know and uh if you ever get married again or <clears throat> uh are in some kind of long-term relationship or a civil ceremony non-state kind of uh union you retain you. You don't give you up. Mm -hmm. And that's a good yeah. lesson for your kids, too. I mean, mm -hmm. how did your kids um, deal with the divorce? Did, how, did you work really hard at shielding them from the drama and chaos? Yeah, I mean, yeah, because we were uh, able to compartmentalize everything and the kids just get, uh, you know, driven back and forth and it was a gradual thing. You know, she moved out of the house first and the kids were still going to school local. And then eventually I got an apartment and we just turned everything into a fun adventure and we didn't focus anything on me or their mother. What was, you know, going on really. And uh, they were young enough to not ask too many questions and old enough to kind of, you know, get that we were just going different places. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know if they'll get a little bit older and then reflect back, but you know, I, I try not to talk about it. I try not to bring anything up. I just focus on what the mission is right now, what we're doing right now. And yeah, focus, we focus on the Fitch boys and uh, you know, everything else is out outside stuff. Yeah. Where do you see yourself uh, a year from now and five years from now? Um, well, I'll be hopefully growing my podcasts and my, my social media platforms, uh, growing my email list, growing my website stuff. Um, I'll be doing a lot more 
seminars, traveling to do seminars, small groups uh, in town and around, uh, just more teaching, more public speaking. Uh, I hope in five years I'll have, you know, the business idea that I have will be, uh, you know, profitable and I'll be able to help, uh, you know, build build the brands and build notoriety around a lot of the MMA fighters and then hopefully branch that off into helping other people as well. So I've got a lot on the plate, a lot to be working towards. I'm excited about. And, uh, you know, if anything changes, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I make the appropriate uh, pivots. <laughs> the appropriate pivots and wash the shit out of those dishes. Yep. Let me get it done. Where do you want people to go to a website, a resource? Uh, Johnfish.net is the best place to go because it's updated often and we have links to everything I got going on. I love it. I am going to be going to bed tonight because I'm three hours ahead. You're in California. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Yep. I got more I'm, interviews to do, I think. Oh, okay. I I'm in Philly. <laughs> so it's eight, 8 PM for me, which means in a little while I'm going to be going to bed thinking about failing upward. Upward. Yep. I like that. John, join me again sometime. Uh, we met about a year ago. I'm glad yeah. you joined me tonight. I know you're going to be speaking at various events encouraging men to be the best mm -hmm. version of themselves. And I just yep. wish you the best of that. And I hope your following grows. And I want everyone to follow you on YouTube, mm -hmm. follow yep. your podcast. I, just, I find it very enjoyable. Uh, and my brother, Tony, you know, Tony Bruno. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. he's, he's a good guy. And he yeah. probably, after he sees this, he's probably going to want in his channel as well. So, but I wish you the best. Stay in touch, and I will do the same, John. Thank you for joining me tonight. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. A pleasure.